If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This has been another episode sponsored by Online Horse College. If you haven't had a look at the wide variety of equine-specific accredited courses, then go to onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Today's guest is Nicole McGoffin. Nicole's another Grand Prix rider, competitor, trainer and coach. She brings in something a little bit different though. Her background is in classical ballet. With the background of classical ballet, she's able to bring harmony, fluency and elegance into a dressage training. We'll talk to her a bit about that a bit later on. How are you today, Nicole? I'm great, thank you very much. How are you? Um, great. <laughs> Nicole, we start off with a favourite quote or something that you say when you're teaching. Have you got something for us? I certainly do. I have a quote that I repeat not only to my students but to myself. And it is frustration begins when your skill has ended. I think it's very easy um, for us to become frustrated as riders and trainers when we're working with an animal who obviously doesn't speak the same language as us. Yes. And I think it's, you know, vitally important that we remember the reason why we're frustrated is because we don't have an answer to the problem. And it is not the horse's fault, nor is it the horse problem that there's a training hiccup, but that we have to look at ourselves and find a skillful way to answer the issue that has been presented to us. Mm, mm. It does. It puts it all back on you. And as you say, horses don't speak English. They don't speak the same language. We've got to learn to speak their language if we need to communicate with them. Absolutely. We are to take responsibility mm. for the horses that we produce. It is They are a reflection on our own training and our own knowledge base. Yeah. So, you know, when you're being presented with hiccups, and we all are along the way, it's really important to source further education of yourself to find ways to answer those hiccups. Yeah, yeah. Now, Nicole, you've got a background in classical ballet. So how did that work? Did you have horses first, ballet first, or how did that no. work? No. Yeah. I, I had ballet first, yeah. um, much to my parents' pleasure, I guess. <laughs> they uh -huh. certainly wanted to raise a girl that uh, I was the only girl in the family. I have three brothers. So they were hoping to raise um, a little lady, and I think that they were taught that ballet, classical ballet would be a, a nice avenue for a young girl. So I started dancing when I was five. And um, my mum was very heavily involved in the dance school. So it was sort of an, I guess, wasn't really something I chose to do, but it's certainly something that we became very involved in. And I danced right up until the age of 16. But I had on and off um, injuries that were sort of really affecting my ability to go much further within the dancing industry and be successful. So um, I kept telling my parents I loved horses and they tried really hard to ignore that for a good five years. But um, they eventually gave in and <laughs> allowed me to have lessons at a riding school. So I started a little later, I guess, mm -hmm. than some. Yeah. Do you remember your first lesson? You know, because it is, it, it is a bit later. Yeah, I actually really do. Yeah, <laughs> I tell us remember about the it. horse and everything. Yeah. So I rode a horse called Spike, his name was, I guess he was Grey. Yeah. And I was having a lesson with Caddy Icant. So yeah. she went into a vending. Um, but well, to a very successful event as she became. Mm -hmm. And every corner, Spike used to stop and pretend he needed to do a wee. Mm -hmm. So I spent my whole lessons just standing up in the stirrups in each corner oh, <laughs> yeah. for my very cluey boy <laughs> to think he was going to do his wee. And yeah, I spent um, probably a year riding Spike in my lessons. Yeah. Very cool. I remember him really well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and they have such a lovely look in their eyes, don't they? I might just stop in this corner oh, and I might just stop in the next one. Yeah, yeah just the, the most resilient horses, the riding school horses. They you are. know, what they have to put up with, with yep. people trying to learn and do their best up there. They're just, yeah, they have hearts of gold. Yeah. Must, you know, I had often in horse that does a good job as a school horse. 
Yeah, yeah. And then from those early lessons, you know, to become involved in dressage as much as you have and then to bring in that background of ballet, when did you realise that your background in ballet, classical ballet, would help you with your dressage? Uh, almost straight away, I guess, when I realised that I didn't um, have problems sitting on a horse the way they wanted us to. So, you know, I guess primarily when you're first learning, there's such a huge focus on position. And that was something because I've trained my body um, to hold such good posture for so many years, I found it incredibly easy. So it really, for me, was not something that I'm um, challenged, I guess. And I think... Obviously, you know, as a coach, seeing someone come in and ride for the first time and being able to sit easily, you know, excited the coaches. So I, you know, I became excited myself that I thought perhaps, you know, I could be good at this. And um, we certainly come from a family of elites, I think. So I've always, you know, we always choose avenues that we hope we can be successful at. So, yeah, yeah it was yeah. something that I felt like I could work with and I felt like I could have the discipline to do a job with, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So choosing that avenue that you could be successful at, was that when you made the choice to have a career with horses? What happened there? Yeah, I think, I know it seems a little crazy, but I sort of felt like straight away I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um you know, I rode a little bit Australian stock horses when I first started riding and then moved into a little bit of eventing and then the fences got way too scary for me. So <laughs> I decided that dressage was much more suited to my character. And I just I felt like I just knew that this is what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. And don't yeah. get me wrong, I didn't go in blind. I realized it would be a very difficult industry to be successful at. You know, everyone wants to be able to you know, play with horses, I guess, oh, sure. for the job. Sure. Yep. So I knew that I would have to, you know, make sure I do other things in my life that will contribute to me being successful in the dressage arena as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you were going to employ someone or talk to someone or recommend someone, what sort of core skills do you think that they need to commence in the horse, in the horse career? I think... You know, first and foremost, they have to love horses. Yep. I know it seems, um, you know, an obvious thing to say, but sometimes it's not always there, the true passion for the horse and, and the horse's welfare and quality of life. You know, that really stands out for me, you know, just watching people interact with them. You know, do they let the horse sniff them? And do they pat them? And do they talk affectionately to them? That's important to me. Mm. And um, second. That is definitely a work ethic. Yes. It's a really hard industry. There is no, you know, prancing around like a princess in this industry. You really have to be prepared to work really hard and, I guess, you know, put in and be prepared to take experience as your pay. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you sacrifice to be in this industry. And I think the work ethic is in a huge mm. instrument to be successful. Yes, yes. And I think too, you know, like you've always got to think, well, I'm going to work just that little bit harder because I'm going to work harder than the person next to me or the person yeah. next to me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's surrounding yourself uh, or, you know, if someone's coming into the industry, selecting someone you want to work with because mm. you want them to be your mentor. Yes. You know, you have to appreciate the way they ride and train and the way they present themselves. So, you know, there's no aligning yourself with someone if they're not really the values that you wish to carry through for yourself. So yeah. it's important, you know, when you're looking to involve yourself in the industry that you do select professional writers whose views are really similar to your own. Yes, yes, not just the, the training but the actual personality. Correct, yeah. It's not just how many ribs they have won. It has to be more than that. Mm. It has to be the package of yep. what that rider yes. can do to help you, yeah. What do you think is the best thing about working in the horse industry? Um, I think the flexibility for me, that's certainly a highlight. You know, we have a family, so we have three children, and I think it's been... Lovely to be able to say, well, I'm actually not going to teach this afternoon because 
the kids have something on at school or there's, you know, um, a game that I'd like to go to. So for me, that has been a highlight that I can be a little more selective with my hours of how I work and when I work. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that's probably the highlight in that regard of, you know, what what it can offer back. Um, It's also... You know, it's an incredibly rewarding industry. You get to work with, you know, beautiful people and you get to work with, of course, beautiful horses. And even the ones that pose to be a little bit difficult, you know, you learn from them. And I know myself that personal development, I come gain from working with different people and working with different horses has certainly contributed to the character that I am now. Yes, and I think if you come in from that, positive aspect you know every problem what some people perceive as a problem if you can perceive it as a challenge and and that you're going to oh, learn absolutely. from it absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and it's often our students that pose the challenge as much as the horses can you know people don't always come for a dressage lesson for the same reason that yes. you perhaps approach yes. one with. That's right. You know, I have students that are down to business in the first 10 seconds and I have students that we have a great 10 minutes chatting about what's going on in their lives and, you know, and then we get down to business and it's just being aware that not everyone comes for the same reason as the previous person yes. and, and knowing what it is that they're coming for and adapting yourself to that. Mm. What about people who've influenced you, Nicole? Is it, you know, I mean, I know you've had a few and you've had a few very good coaches. Yeah, sure. Who would you like to talk about? Well, I think my parents first and foremost because I think without their influence in the sense of discipline and certainly my mother's sense of fairness for an animal, she's a very big animal um, lover, so she's always put animals first and we kind of joke that all the time that all the dogs and cats came before we did yeah. but um, so I have that built in me that you know, that the, to do the right thing for the animal has always been you know something that stays with me all the time and both my parents have been successful and both are very disciplined and have great work ethics so first and foremost I think that that certainly shaped me to be able to you know have some success in the industry. Um, so within the industry, um, Tracy Manka was my coach for oh man, let's see, fifteen years, and a real quality person she is, and she certainly also aligned with those same values that the horse is always the priority and the welfare of the horse's mental state is the priority through training. Um, it is never something that she was willing to sacrifice, and so training with her for fifteen years again you know, built on what my parents sort of started, you know, with my childhood. And then from Tracy, I went and trained with Stefan Peters in America. Yes. Um, He, too, is very similar values again, where the horse's mental welfare is of the utmost importance. And he aligns also, again, with that elegance and the beauty and the lightness of the sport. So for me, those three people, well, my mum and dad, Tracy, and Stefan have certainly been the most influential people to me that I really um, continue to use what they taught me every single day. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not going to say you are lucky here because I don't think you get sponsors just thrown to you. Tell us a bit about sponsorship, you know, how you you got your sponsors because it's not luck. It is, you know, you've got to give the sponsors something. No, it's certainly not. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. that's it. It's going in with an attitude of what you can do for them. Yes. I think so many people get to a certain stage and think, oh, well, you know, I've won some things now, so you should want to sponsor me. I've never taken that approach. I um, try to be very involved with my sponsors and always offering my time to them and what more can I do. Um, I guess, again, it's that um, me wanting to be a perfectionist, I want them to value um, what I can do for them as well. So, you know, it's giving back. What can you give? What can you give them, you know, in order for them to want to, you know, use their company against your name? So for me, it was always um, when I approach people for sponsorship, 
it was much more about what um, I could do for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's certainly the, the standout aspect I think you need to look at when you are seeking sponsorship. So your current sponsors, Horseland, Gold Coast and Motorbike, did you approach them? Um, yes, I did. I approached both of them. Yep. So I've been with Mitervite now for, I'm going to say, 20 years. Um, <laughs> they are, have been nothing short of a fantastic company to work with every time I've worked with them. Yep. They just truly look after their riders. It's not some just, you know, little discount you get from them. They really... It's a two-way street. You know, I do what I can for them and they genuinely do what they can for me. Okay. They, in my opinion, have always produced the highest quality of equestrian feeds on market and I really, you know, valued that and that's hence why I sought them out as a sponsor. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to use the best that, you know, I could find for my horses. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly part of, you know, producing our quality athletes is ensuring that you're using quality feeds. Yeah, yeah. What about Horseland Gold Coast? How much you? How many have they been? Yeah, I actually started with Horseland Toowoomba because I lived closer there mm-hmm. at that point in time. Yes. So um, I was teaching the daughters of people who owned Horseland to- Toowoomba and lovely people up there. And when I moved to the Gold Coast, I um, spoke with Richard, who was the manager at the time, and asked if we would be able to transfer my sponsorship from Toowoomba to the Gold Coast. And again, it was more going in and speaking to them about, you know, what I could do for them and the opportunities that I could offer for them more than it was, you know, what are you going to give me? Yeah, um, yeah it became much more about what I can offer them. And, and the other important. sponsor I have... Yeah, it is super important. It is the most important thing. And the other sponsor I have, which is Jean Evans, um, all about physio. Okay. That's a great one yes. for us riders to have. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I think Janine was starting to feel sorry for me needing to go in so often to have my body treated. <laughs> just she was, she actually offered the sponsorship in that case, and you know she's been an invaluable part of keeping my body sound and being able to, you know, ride and you know really stay in one piece. So. Yeah. Okay, so you were going in. So what made you start with physio? Did someone recommend it? Was it something that you thought you needed? No, I'm one of those people that if I was an animal, you probably would have put me down. Um, <laughs> I seem to always have something wrong. Um, I'm, that, I'm that person, you know. So initially it started with I broke my neck and um, had a fracture in my C5. So, and, you know, it obviously caused pain and yes. I was having, you know, difficulty staying comfortable all the time. And then, you know, I now have bulging discs in my back and then had bulging discs in my neck as well that um, have required surgery. So um, going to a physio is 100% part of my survival plan yes. <laughs> to stay yes. in the saddle because without Janine, there, there is just no way that I would be comfortable and be able to ride like I can at the moment because my body really does unfortunately require a lot of maintenance. Yeah. yeah. Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats.com, and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right, now tell us a bit about your horses. Who's the horse who's influenced you the most, or, or you've got a couple of horses who might have influenced you? Yeah, I, I've had a couple, I guess, that, you know, for me have stood out. Um, JB Anzac, um, he was the first horse that we bought as a three year old. My mum and dad bought for me for my birthday. And um, we didn't really know much about horses, I guess, when we bought him. He certainly liked his little bouncy trot and we thought that he was pretty. So (laughs) we purchased him and um, I trained him to Grand Prix um, along with the help with Tracy Manka. She was certainly 100% instrumental in me being able to get the horse to Grand Prix. And he was an absolute standout temperamented animal. He was absolutely incredible just would give his heart and soul every single day for me. And, you know, that became really evident, I think, um, when he was being judged. He certainly wasn't a mega mover and he didn't, you know, do things amazingly. But I think the feel that he gave to people watching him certainly, you know, contributed 
to his success. He was really enjoyed his job and he was really the epitome of a happy athlete. Yeah. And then I moved on to JB Rihanna or Princess Lizzie, she's more commonly known as. Now, she really <laughs> taught me a mountain, and not just about dressage, but about myself. So <laughs> she was born with a tiara on her head, that horse, and she would only ever be treated as a princess every minute of every day. And if she felt like you stepped out of line, she certainly let you know. She, um, an incredibly talented horse, incredibly talented, way superior for my riding ability. Um, but I learned so much from her. I learned, you know, I guess that's where the saying of frustration begins when my skill has ended, really developed with her because every time, you know, something became difficult, I had to remind myself that this is me. This is, I know another rider, a more experienced rider could do a better job. So, Nicole, you have to really think about what it is you're doing and find another way. She was certainly a tricky mare to work with and she had very, very high standards herself. So yeah, yeah. I felt like I was constantly, you know, trying to lift my standards to match her. <laughs> yeah. She's in Germany now. We flew her to Germany last year. So she's in training with Linda Schuler, who yes. was Stefan Peters' assistant trainer for 10, 12 years. So she moved back to Germany, and that's where she is now. And Lyncha, of course, is doing an incredible job. So I'm very grateful for her. Okay. And my new horse is one we bred, actually, um, uh, along with a really lovely lady, Paula Mills. Um, and I bred at a fair imported mare. Um, we bred to Sir Donna Hall, and we have a lovely three-year-old who's just been broken in. And he is a little bit what you know you dream of being able to have. He is incredibly talented. His nature is incredible again. And there's like just nothing I could ask to be changed about him. I feel like he's a little bit of a one in a million, this horse. Yeah. So we're really super excited for his future. Okay. Yeah. What do you think when your proudest moment? Um, I moment, actually think it? the proudest moment, yeah, it is because there's so many different moments for different reasons. Mm. I think one for me was when my parents were the proudest, actually. And I think, I guess that's because, you know, of all the sacrifices they made, they got to be part of this one. Yes. And it was when I rode Bev Edwards' um, four-year-old JB Accomplice at Dressage with the Stars. Yes. I was, um, you know, my first time down there, I certainly didn't have a name for myself. And I was competing against, you know, huge names in our industry and Heath Ryan and Matthew Dowsley were in the class. And we took down this little four-year-old that we kind of hoped would make the second round. And we won. We won four-year-old dressage with the stars. And my mum and dad were there. And I really just remember seeing my dad cry. <laughs> it was really cute. So I think for me, it was one of the proudest moments because I got to share it with people. Yes. And it was certainly, you know, a moment where you know, all the hopes that I could do something in this industry kind of, you know, there is a possibility now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that day sort of encompassed a few topics that really stand out for me. Yeah. So thinking about, you know, where you are now, and I know that you've had your physical challenges, what else do you think there is to getting the Grand Prix, to getting them to... Um, a sports psychologist. Okay. <laughs> we all yep. really need yep. one of those. Yep. So I work very heavily with Jonah Oliver. Um, he's a sports psychologist and he's worked with uh, some of Australia's hugest teams, Essendon Football Club, Tennis Australia, um, Brisbane Raw Soccer. So he's very experienced and certainly an elite person within his own field. And he has been absolutely instrumental in my ability to – get the best from myself, yeah. I guess. So, like, you know, I guess we all talk about how amazing we can ride at home and how amazing we ride in the warm-up and then for some, you know, unknown reason to us, it doesn't seem to pull together in the competition arena. And I did suffer from what I would call extreme, you know, anxiety when I was competing. And I um, started working with him in 2008, sort of when we were doing um, a hopeful tour into Beijing games, and from there, really, I can say that the man certainly has changed my life. Actually, not just my my competitive life, but my life in general, and just how I how I deal with anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly 
value sports psychology. You know, it's a sport that requires a very holistic view, and yes. that's certainly a huge area that I think can encourage people to, you know, experiment with themselves, yeah. It's very easy to get into the negative self-talk, you know, just a little bit can create a bit more and create a bit more. If, you know, Absolutely. It's and it's a sport of it's a sport of criticism. Mm. Oh, so yeah. you go into the arena yeah. and you're asking, you know, what can I do better? And it's certainly not the judge's fault that they write that down. That's what you're asking for. So yes. it's being, you know, constructive with how you deal with that and, you know, working with the judges who are more than happy to help and just really, you know, knowing how to deal with that, you know. And when you don't feel like you're being successful and you don't feel like you're doing a good job, is you know, you seek help. Yes. That's, that's yes. how you've got to deal with it and that's how you've got to learn and that's how you've got to grow from that. So if you've got a student who you're teaching, you're at a competition and they're about to, you know, they're just warming up or they're getting ready to compete and they've got that bit of the negative self-talk that's coming out in the conversation, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think, you know, the main message I got from Jonah, um, and I guess it's a little controversial, but that's okay. He always says, I don't really care how you feel. Do you know what you have to do? Mm-hmm. So, you know, Jonah never came to a show and was like, oh, so, Nicole, how do you feel today? He's like, I don't really care how you feel. Yeah. What I want to know is do you know what you have to do when you enter that arena? So if I'm warming students up in a competition scenario and I can see that, you know, they are starting to be affected by their anxiety, yep. I become very doing-focused with them. So when you enter the arena, these are the two things I want you to be really working hard on, and it might you know, obviously it's different for everyone. It might be that, you know, when you go through the corners, you really allow that horse to supple and loosen his neck mm-hmm. and or, or making sure that you stay accurate to your markers. I just become very doing focused yep. rather than feeling focused. Okay. Yes. Okay. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look horsechats.com. All right. Now, when you're at competitions or when you've got your own horse, what's a common fault, a common problem, you know, with your own students or people that you see, with people who go to compete in the dressage arena? It doesn't have to be at a high level. or Maybe it's a, a yeah, problem sure. that gets repeated. We stop training. Stop training? <laughs> we stop training. We stop training. Okay. <laughs> we just started to become geography focused instead of training uh, focused. Yes. Um, so we go, okay, I'm going to ride this test. That's A, enter, and C, track left. And I'm like, yeah, but what, what, does that, what, what does that encompass? Like, you know, what is that that you're doing there? You can't just follow geography. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the hardest part of it is staying true to your training. And I do this myself, and I certainly teach my students to, that if you genuinely feel like you – didn't ride something in there as well as you could and it's developing into a repetitive thing you're seeing in that competition arena, raise your hand, take an error and re-ride it again. Your okay. job in there is to train. It's to show your training, yep. not show your ability to just follow geography. Yes. It has to be more than that. The people that have success are the ones that show a high quality of training whilst following geography, mm-hmm. not geography and then some occasional training moments. You know, I think that it is very hard in our sport to become brave enough, really, to say, no, I'm really going to say that that was not acceptable from myself or my horse, and I'm going to ride that again. And if you end up being eliminated, then so be it. But next time you enter the arena, you may not experience those problems. So in the long run, you do yourself a favour. Okay. All right, Nicole, tell us about a book that you might recommend to our listeners, something that's going to complement their training. I think, um, there, I mean, there's so many books out there, really, isn't there? I actually think I would lean more to inspirational stories okay. than I would le- lend to sort of practical how-to ride books. Mm-hmm. And then, again, everyone sort of is interested and in, learns in different ways. But for me, I'm definitely more drawn to books of psychology and why I do things and, you know, how I can better myself in responses to things perhaps than I would learn from reading a book about, you know, technical dressage things, I think. So it's a little personal, I guess. So it's just knowing a little more about how you learn and, you know, adapting, finding something that suits you more than I think, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. then it is yeah. such a, you know, sort of, you know, I think, you know, this would suit everyone type of an answer, yeah. Okay, okay. What are you looking forward to now? You've got your, you've got your young horse, your Sir Donahall. Is that what you're looking forward to? That's what you're... Yeah, and going back to Germany and mm-hmm. riding with Lyncher, with Lizzie, that's certainly something I'm super excited about. Um, but, yeah, certainly training the new boy. His name is Bert. Um, mm-hmm. I really – that horse is super exciting. He's just – yeah, he's kind of like a fairy tale, you know, what you hope a horse could be like. And, yeah, I think that he's got a really exciting future ahead of him. And it's been a long time since I've started with a clean slate. On a horse, so I'm really excited to get um, an insight into my own training because that is really effectively what I think you get when you start on a clean slate. It's a little bit of a reflection of yourself and where you're at. So I'm really excited about that too, yeah. Okay, now can you summarise your philosophy with horses? You sort of talked about it right through. Just summarise it before we um, say goodbye. Yeah, the first and foremost is that your horse needs to be happy. And, you know, when you are presenting your final product to the judges, that you're presenting a happy athlete that, you know, has been trained in a kind and harmonious manner. And I think that it is, you know, a a huge reflection on on everyone's character. So I think it's a little bit of a, a character test for me is, I guess, how I see it. You know, I want people to know that, or think that my horses are happy and, you know, that they're going around and doing their job and it's not becoming something that is forced or something that is, you know, uncomfortable for them. So for me, it is, you know, produce a happy athlete in the best way that you can. And, you know, if you're having troubles, really just self-reflect and find another way or, you know, go to someone else for help and, you know, fresh eyes, see different things and different resolutions. So, you know, it's just staying a little more open-minded and making sure that the horse's welfare always remains your priority. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nicole, how can people contact you? Um, probably Facebook is, you know, my most common form of contact. I clinic throughout Australia now. So um, we have two clinics in Melbourne and one in Adelaide. So, um, and occasionally in, and in other parts of Queensland, but they're my regular monthly clinics. Yeah. So, but yeah. just on Facebook is probably the easiest way that for people to get hold of me. Yeah. Sure. sure. Those details will also be on horsechats.com slash Nicole McGoffin or go to horsechats.com, search for Nicole or search for McGoffin. So thanks, Nicole, for your time. Great talking to you. Really good and very interested, you know, having a story a little bit different and starting off the classical ballet and then, you know, your first your first lesson on Spike. I think you, you go back to those early days and you think, wow, you know, maybe I really have achieved something. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay. All right, Nicole, hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime soon. So thanks today and talk to you later. Lovely. Okay, Thanks bye. for your time. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.